Hi, I'm Kate Gray. I'm here at Bournemouth University telling my story as a Paralympic athlete, but also as a reporter in the media to hopefully address some of those issues around diversity and equality. Um, yeah, so this is kind of my second round doing this today, but hopefully this morning was a practice, so or earlier on this afternoon was a practice, so this afternoon now will be uh, sort of the, the real thing. And it's a good turnout, actually. I think a lot of you are swimmers, right? Yeah? Yes. Yeah, I hope you're not missing a training session to come here. Yeah. <laughs> I did hear that. I have justified that, actually, if you're missing a physical training, you're going to make up with it mental mental training today because a lot of the stuff I do talk about will incorporate a lot of those different skills you'll need but it's just great to have a good turnout and hopefully you'll enjoy it as much as, as much as the guys did earlier so, so that's like my little introduction I do use the PowerPoint just to kind of keep me on track more than anything I don't let that kind of dictate everything but we have got the video working which is great so we can play a few videos out and there's photos as well um, there'll be time for questions at the end so you know, if you want to ask, if you definitely don't understand something throughout, then please do. I do talk quite fast, so you have to keep up with the pace, but um, hopefully you can, you'll can you enjoy the, the story. So I always start off with my proudest moments because I sort of think, a lot of people think, well, what has she done to deserve coming and talking to us and telling us what she's done? What has she achieved? And actually, I've listed off events more than anything because one thing you'll notice about my story is I don't really emphasise on the winning and the medals and the great achievements. I focus my story on the journey. Now, it's mainly because before I'd achieved all these things and gone to all these things, which was probably about 10 years ago, I had two dreams. And one was to become a teacher. I always wanted to be a school teacher, PE teacher, actually, because I love sport and I love taking part in it and thought, well, combine the two there. And the other was because I always wanted to be, and the other dream was to be a Paralympic swimmer or to be a Paralympic medalist. And actually, neither of those dreams have I accomplished. Yet, I would not have changed what I've done in the last 10 years. And that's probably what you'll notice, and it's probably very rare that you'll probably speak to an athlete who's not here to talk about all her achievements. She's actually going to talk about the struggles of getting there. And hopefully that's why I've been asked back a few more times because my story is hopefully relatable to what you guys will go through or what you've been through or prepare you for what may be ahead and make you realise that it is hard but you can still come through and come out really, really positive. And as you can see on there, London 2012 Paralympics is on there but I have to admit it is not in the way I thought it would be. If you've read my biog, sometimes they give the whole story away actually but there's a lot more to add into the story. But that's kind of the route we're going to take. And, um, and, and we'll go from there. But like all good stories, I think they should start from the beginning. But before we do go to that, I've got a little video to prove I can actually swim. Because a lot of people go, well, we've never seen you swim. Can you actually swim? You just come up and talk to us and say you can swim. So I actually put this video together. So don't judge my, um, my sort of editing skills. But it's just a way to kind of get you settled in and enjoy. So assuming all IT will work.
like to finish on that quote because it's kind of a very relevant to the, the route I take when I have been trying to achieve what I want to. And that's probably all the high points in my career. So you've seen them all now. Now we're going to go through all the, the stuff of actually helping me reach that point. And actually in that particular race, can anyone tell which is my best stroke? Was it obvious? What did someone say? Breaststroke. Yeah, that's right. That's correct. Good job. So um, my best stroke was breaststroke, but I hated fly. But in the IM, it's fine because you get out of the way on the first length, don't you? Um, and actually in that race, I broke the world record. It was in a heat, which I managed to seem to do. I swim well in heats and then backing up in the final, my friend who was in the photo with me at the end there, she actually beat me in the final, but we were both on the podium together. But um, that was just a, a kind of a really nice memory. And it was actually in Rio, we did that in 2009 at the World Championship. So it's quite a nice um, feeling towards Rio thinking, well, hopefully next time I can go back there and take the world record and the gold, so hopefully. But as I said, I always like to start from the very beginning and um, this picture is the very beginning for me, well, two years into my very beginning. I always kind of say something a bit different on that photo than what you see here. Can anybody, anybody notice that? Because right, you can say it aloud, it's fine if you've noticed it. Yes. I've got two hands. Yes, correct. I, and I like to say I've got slightly longer hair and a slightly flatter stomach, but I'm much prettier swimming costume. But yeah, the obvious point is that I, I only have... Well, I have two hands in that photo and that photo was taken about two weeks before um, my accident uh, I don't know if any of you know or have read about it but I managed to put my left hand into a sausage machine and it got chopped off Ugh. there's a few hands on faces there um, bit of a funny story really but at the time I don't think it was funny but it sticks with your memory so if you don't remember me being a Paralympic swimmer you'll know I'm the girl who chopped her arm in a sausage machine actually at some schools I'm a sausage machine girl so um, it's a funny story to remember me by and at the time my parents were just uh, hysterical about it it was terrible for them because they saw it all happen and just to put a bit of explanation behind it I'm a farmer's daughter and I was a really naughty two-year-old probably where the name terrible twos came from that climbed on everything and jumped on everything and didn't listen to what her parents told her and as a result I climbed onto the machine, put my hand in and it got severed off. So it all happened quite quickly. I don't remember a lot and actually you're very resilient at a young age and I was lucky that I don't remember an awful lot that happened other than the ambulance which was really really exciting so I thought I'm going to get to ride in that. <laughs> Forget about the fact that the arm's in a bag of peas and we're trying to save it in case we can set it back on. And also that um, I was going to make a Nino sound the whole time. So, yeah, it was quite exciting that. But actually, once I got to the hospital and it had all been sort of taken off and had to, had to sort of look ahead of life with, with having one hand, my parents just didn't know what to do because I'm from a very small little town in Bristol and um, no one ever has a disability and there wasn't, no one really knew what was out there for me. And actually, my parents particularly thought, gosh, what's she going to be able to do? all her dreams of becoming whatever she wanted to be could be over. And all I could think about when I woke up was I went to suck my left thumb because I was left-handed and I used to suck my left thumb and there was nothing there, it was just a big bandage. I looked to my mum, I was like, Mum, where's my thumb? She was like, just didn't know what to say, she just cried into her hand, she just couldn't deal with it, it was just too new for her. And I very quickly found my right thumb, put that in my mouth and I was sorted. And very quickly I became adaptable to my disability. And that is what I kind of use as my keyword throughout. You've got to adapt, you've got to change to the situation, not dwell on it. I could have sat there and cried and gone, oh, I haven't got a thumb anymore. But there's always a way around it. Now I can guarantee it's not as easy as finding your other thumb and putting that in your mouth, because it's not that easy. But at two years old, I was already showing signs that I, I was going to be okay. And I always wanted to reassure, reassure my parents that I was going to be okay. Because for them, they saw it was their fault and they still feel guilty about it now, they can't talk about it. And for me, that's quite hard because I don't want them to feel like that because it was my fault. I'm that naughty two-year-old that did it all. But their first worry, actually, so going to school was a little bit of a worry for them, mainly because I looked like that, <coughs> which is a bit of a cheeky, cheeky little girl with crazy ginger curly hair, freckles. I think I've got a gap in my teeth. I think I've got school dinners down my jumper. I was a tomboy and I had one hand. So at no point was I fitting into any particular group, whether it was girly or boys or tidy. I was not fitting into any groups. My parents were really worried I was going to get picked on and bullied because I didn't look like everybody else. And school is a bit of a, a, bit of a cruel place. Like, you're meant to fit in. You're meant to look like everybody else and sound like everybody else and be in with the group and be in with the cliques. But I didn't, didn't really see what that was all about. I went to school and I was actually really proud of who I was. 
I might have stood out a bit, didn't really know why, but I was quite glad that I was very ignorant to those sort of things because I never felt intimidated or isolated. And everyone sort of goes, well, how did you get through it? Like, you seem so confident. And I always had a smile on my face. I was never down, I was never sad. And I think that picture kind of sums up for me of how I was at school. I think that was a really important learning curve about getting over my disability and realising I was going to be fine. And actually, I was a really determined young girl. And I'd get stuck into every activity, so never would the teacher be like, oh, you can't do that, you've only got one hand. And if I heard that word can't, oh my gosh, that made me want to do it even more. It was kind of like they used it against me, so I'd end up working even harder. And that's, that's how I proved to people that having a disability was absolutely fine and we'll get over it. And so much so, because I didn't realise why people were a bit unsure what to call me or what, how to act around me, because actually a lot of the time the kids were fine. No offence, parents, but it's the parents that passed on that negative attitude of don't look, don't stare, don't talk about it, because in their time when they were younger, disability wasn't known, it wasn't around. And sort of as I was growing up, it was becoming more and more familiar, but not quite so. So they were there going, don't look, especially in swimming. You walk around a swimming pool, you can't hide it, can you? Like getting changed in the change rooms, where it's all out there, girls, we can't hide it. And parents would be like, no, you can't, you can't talk about it. And I found that really hard because I wanted to tell people about it. So much so that at school I used to wear my prosthetic arm and I'd take it off in the middle of class and play tricks on people and leave it lying around and it was, it was battery powered so I'd suddenly pretend that it'd stop working when it stuck on someone's nose. I'd be like, oh it's stuck, you have to stay there all day and someone called home to get some spare batteries and I was like, I was only joking but a lot of, it just meant that people felt comfortable and they felt happy around me and talking about it. So much so now that it's actually really squishy. It looks like a sausage as well. My friends squeeze it like a stress ball, like because it's so squishy. And on the swimming team, we have like who's got the best stump, and mine's the best. But we'll, we won't tell the other athletes that. But I, that's how far I would go to making fe people feel okay around it. Because I can see you giggling now, and I can see you thinking, well, actually, maybe I will ask her later, or maybe I won't look at it in a weird way next time. And that was my way of showing people that it was all going to be okay. Now. The one thing that also really helped with my confidence was sport because I wasn't particularly good at math or English. I hated reading. I wasn't academically smart, so I was never the standout student in lessons. I'm quite a competitive person, so I needed fi to find something to prove that I was the best at, or at least trying to be the best at. And actually, that happened with sport. And thanks to some very supportive parents, they threw me in in every sport. You know, they even put me in dancing and I don't really look like a natural dancer, do I? That's just an example of my prosthetic arm as well, which they don't even do prosthetic skins with, with freckles on, so it's not really the right colour, but I'm pretty sure that's changed now. That was about 15 years ago, so I'm sure it's advanced since then. But I got thrown into every sport and I loved it because actually every time I turned up to a club, the coach or the teacher would look at me and think, oh my God, how's she going to do this? She's only got one hand. There's no one else with one hand. We've never taught anyone with one hand. How's she going to do it? And, uh, you know, the first couple of sessions, I would have been pretty rusty. I was pretty bad. But I saw how other people did it. I then went home and I taught myself how to do it. So playing netball, for example. Like, most people won't be able to teach someone how to catch with one hand. And I managed to teach myself. It took a lot of hours of standing at the wall, throwing the ball over and over again until I worked out what balance, what didn't, what I could hold, what I couldn't. And no one else could help me. And actually, that was the best challenge for myself because it meant that I never became reliant on anyone. I was independent and I was confident enough to go, right, it doesn't matter. I will find my way around it. I didn't rely on other people. Actually, sport was the best chance to prove people wrong and go, watch this. And they'd be like, oh, OK, yeah, she, she can do that. And breaking down barriers is what I've always tried to do throughout my, my lifetime. And sport was the best way to show that. And I'm sure you guys do that, whether your coach goes, right, you've got to do this, this 50 and 30 seconds. And you're like, oh, I'm going to do it in 29, actually. And you go and do it in 29, and you feel even better. And it's that, that moment of going, yeah, I've just proved someone wrong. I've just shown them what I can do. And it actually makes you a much stronger athlete rather than going, oh, that's too fast. I can't do that. Why not go one better and go the other way? That's what I've always tried to do. We probably think, actually, she's got quite a long way. So this is all the way through school. Well, about secondary school when I mastered the game of netball and you know, play, playing all the sports I did. That's me, but I haven't really mentioned swimming. And that's because swimming wasn't a very enjoyable experience for me to begin with. Now, I'm guessing most of you started swimming around sort of four, five, six years old mainly because you need to learn to swim. It's life or death, isn't it? You get thrown into water, you need to be able to pop back up and sort of save yourself. And that's exactly what I had to do. But when I dived in, I, I didn't pop back up because I hadn't quite managed that whole 
treading water and not drowning idea. And that's mainly because if you think about it, if you get into a pool, I was like a boat with one paddle and I just swam round in circles because I just don't have the other paddle to use and I hadn't worked out how to use my body to, to balance. And it was so frustrating. Like all my friends were progressing through learn to swim and they were doing 10, 15 meter, 25 meter badges and I was still in the paddling pool trying to work out how to stay afloat. And I was like, Mum, I don't, I don't want to swim anymore. I can't, I can't do it. And that was the one, one sport I actually said I can't do it in. She goes, well, if you don't swim, then you won't be able to go on holiday. You won't be able to go to the seaside. You, know, you won't be able to go to parties. You'll just have to, just have to watch. And I didn't like that idea. So I kept going at it. And it did take me about five years to master swimming in a straight line from one end of the pool to the other. And what I do now is I, well, I've proved I can swim, so it's quite a relief, that first video. It does prove I can swim just about in a straight line. Backstroke, not very good. But um, I can just about swim in a straight line. And, um, and that's mainly because I've worked out I'll kick one leg stronger than the other, and I won't get into all the, the technical side of it. But once you've mastered it, it then becomes quite natural. So by the time I was 10 years old, I could swim. And I was like, OK, I can swim now. I think I'm going to focus on school and all my other sports, because actually, when I was 10 years old, that was 15 years ago, Paralympic sport was not known then. Paralympics was not on the TV, and I was not aware that having a disability meant that I could have a career in becoming a Paralympic swimmer. So I was just going to stop there and carry on with the rest of my life. And actually, it was just by chance that a swimming teacher at my club goes, Kate, have you ever tried a disability competition? And I'd actually never really heard the word disability. Not because my parents didn't want to call me that or label me, but with disability in that type kind of society becomes limitations and sort of assumptions of what you can and can't do. And I, I, didn't, I didn't want to feel like that and they didn't want me to feel like that. So I wasn't really aware what opportunities lay ahead of me in the world of disability sport. So I thought, well, I'll go along and see what happens. And actually, it was the first competition I went to that I'd actually won a medal. And I still carry that medal with me. It's my proudest medal. It's also my smallest medal. And if you can all see, it's actually a bronze medal, so it's not even the best colour. But it's the medal that made me realise I was quite good at swimming for someone with one hand. And it made me realise that I want to carry on swimming. Because also at that competition, and I'm sure a lot of you will be able to relate to this, but I met other people like me. Because you've got to be quite mad to be a swimmer, don't you? Like, it's the hours that you do. You find a lot of common ground with people at an event that they do the same as you. In this event, I met other people with one arm, one leg, in a wheelchair with other disabilities. And they showed me how they did things, which I couldn't do. So at the time, I didn't know how to put my hair up with one hand. And actually, I met a girl who showed me. And she didn't know how to tie her shoelaces, so I showed her how to tie her shoelaces. And it might sound really small little things that you guys might take for granted, but to me that was really annoying, because every morning before school I had to get my mum to do my hair, which just took five minutes longer. She never did it the way I wanted it to. So I'd managed to find out how to, to do my own hair. And that was a massive sort of step up. And I realised, right, I want to swim, and I want to spend time with these kind of people. And that was the spur to go, right, off you go, let's get in the pool, let's do some more swimming. And sometimes, and you guys might have felt that moment of inspiration, or you might still be waiting for it, but it just takes one thing and you go, I'm going to keep going at this. Now, at that time, I didn't think I was going to be a Paralympic swimmer. At that time, I just thought, I want to keep going at swimming. So I went back to my club and I started swimming a few more times a week, and then sort of by the time I was about 13 years old, when I was just going into secondary school, um, I was training every, well, five times a week, six times a week. And um, the club was really accepting me and realising you know, I had a lot of potential and I was, I was competing at national level. And still it wasn't a huge event, it still didn't feel like it was really going anywhere, but they just started funding disabled or Paralympic athletes. And they go, right Kate, we think you're going to be a Paralympic swimmer. We want you to aim for Athens in 2004. So I'd have been about 15 years old, so it would be quite a big deal. We want you to be this Paralympic swimmer, but you need to do this much training. You need to be, forget about your other sports. You know, school's important, but actually you need to really focus on your training because we believe you can get there. Now, I, some of you might have heard these things before, but as a 13-year-old girl who loved school, who was told to give up all her other sports, was quite a big thing to deal with. And I didn't say, no, I don't want to do that. I said, OK, but I'm not going to go full on as you want me just yet. And some coaches might look at me and think, oh, you can't say that in front of a group of kids that are all trying to train there. You know, they're, so it's really hard to make it. But actually, the reality is, is that you're not going to be an athlete forever. There's going to come a time when you can't, you've got, you have to stop swimming, you have to get a real job. 
And it was actually my very wise parents to go, Kate, you also need to make sure you've got your school and your academic career and all your friends because they're going to be the ones that are there if things don't go to plan. And I took those words on board and I actually remembered them all the way through my career because like swim, like, unlike footballers, we don't earn 50 grand a week. So I was never going to make enough money to make a living out of being an athlete. Um, so I, I progressed slowly. I was a slow progressing athlete. Most swimmers, they try and push them on really, really early. And then they reach a peak and then they drop. And it's quite hard to come back from that drop. So it's always really important to kind of assess, right, am I enjoying this? Yep, yeah, okay, move on again. Am I enjoying this? Yep, yeah, next step. And that's what I did. I made sure all the way through I was enjoying it and I was doing it for me and not doing it for anybody else. I wasn't doing it for mum or dad. I was always the one getting myself up in the morning. And as a result, that progression led to some real positive things. And as I put up on the board earlier, I went to World Championships in 2006. I didn't make it into Athens, but that's mainly because I decided it was my career choice. I didn't want to interfere with my GCSEs. I wanted to focus on school and I wasn't ready to put that much hours in. Come 2006 though, I was moving into sixth form, I was taking control of my life, I could drive myself around a bit more, and I went to the World Championships, and I saw the power of disability sport and how great it was becoming. Because again, in 2006, that was just under 10 years ago, we still didn't know much about Paralympic sport. And I wanted to make sure that the sport I was putting my heart and soul and lifestyle into was something that was going to earn the respect and the recognition that I felt like it deserved. And going to South Africa in 2006 to the World Championships where I came away with a medal as well, came away with, a, as you saw in the video, a silver medal in the relay, gave me that, that boost to go, right, this is when it all turns into serious stuff. And you'll hit that point, you'll go, right, this is when it gets serious. Or you might go, right, I've had enough of the sport and I'm going to take a different route. But for me, I knew that I wanted to go to the Paralympics and I wanted to go to university and get a degree as well because I always wanted to be a teacher. Like I said, those are my two goals. How was I going to get there? Well, I was going to have to get there by getting into the University of Bath because that was the university I decided to get into. But at the time, I didn't have the grades to get in because I wanted to do a proper course. I know that sounds really, really bad, but they do provide courses for athletes, which are great. I'm not putting them down, but I knew that if I came away from that course, and my swimming hadn't gone well, I would have to do another course again. I wanted to do a full degree, and be respected as an, as an athlete and a student. So two years of sixth form and two years of stepping up my training to be able to keep up with an able-bodied squad. Because remember, all the way through, I was never training with disabled people. I was always training with an able-bodied squad. So I was sometimes training in a younger group. So when I went to university, there was no younger group. I was going to have to try and keep up with the, the big guys training for the Olympics. And that was a massive barrier to break through because at the University of Bath, they'd never had a disabled person trained with the able-bodied squad there. They'd only, they'd only accepted Olympic standard people. So I went there for two weeks on a training, training um, sort of program and I just trained so hard for two weeks to prove them wrong because they were ready to go, oh, actually, I think you need to go into a disability or a more, um, a more accommodating club for you. I went in there and I proved them wrong. And actually, I think I changed the way lo they looked at Paralympic and disability sport because it was when disability events were starting to integrate into able body programs at nationals and regionals. And there was a little bit of negativity around, oh God, they, they don't look like proper athletes. And I wanted to prove that we were proper athletes that were training just as hard. And as a result, all that training paid off and all the academic paid off. I know it sounds like I just slipped through that, but there were tough times there. But actually, I learned a lot of skills there, such as time management, organising myself, not relying on mum and dad to cook, clean and get me to and from training. Because when you get to university, mum and dad aren't there anymore. And that's when you realise how much you want it. Because if you don't want it, <laughs> it's very easy just to stop. And so I learned all those skills while being at home. So then when I got to university, <coughs> it was a much smoother transition. And I had six months to qualify for the Beijing Paralympics. And that's quite a big transition to make with a new club, a new training, um, tr training programme, new home, new friends. It was a massive turnaround, but I love those kind of challenges because I get stuck in and I think, yes, this is a new challenge. This is how I keep it fresh. This is how I keep it fun. And it was, um, it was a tough few months, especially when I'm going training at five o'clock in the morning and my friends are coming in from the nightclub at five o'clock in the morning. And you just wave passing by and like, hi. They're in a, usually, a, well, I'm actually probably in just as bad a state as them because I want to go back to bed and they need to get to bed. But 
I knew that was a commitment I had to make. And some people call it sacrifice, but I, did, I don't call it sacrifice. I call it a commitment to my sport. I didn't regret it at all. And luckily, as a result, I ended up qualifying for the Beijing Paralympics. And this is the point when I realised I'm really behind on my photos because I just keep talking. But we've seen those photos. So I qualified for the Beijing Paralympics. Now, I'm guessing you guys can remember what my best stroke was. Breaststroke, yeah. I don't need to explain to you what breaststroke is, but for those that don't know, breaststroke is the stroke your mum does, so she doesn't get her hair wet. <laughs> um, it's the one that my mum did anyway. And um, I went to Beijing as a bit of an underdog, really, because I wasn't quite top ranked in the world, and my main goal was London 2012, because by the Beijing Paralympics, we knew we had the London 2012 Paralympics. And coming from you know, a sport that doesn't get big crowds, you guys can relate to that. We don't get massive turnouts at nationals. It's not like a real big ticketed event. It might be changing now, but it, it didn't used to be. So competing in front of 14,000 people was something that I had to get used to. So I thought, right, I'm going to go there and just take it all in. I'm going to learn so much, because when I get to London in four years' time, that is going to be scary. That is where the pressure is going to be on. So I want to prepare myself for this kind of experience. And I went out for my race and I looked at it and I thought, right, that is 14,000 people. But I was excited because I thought, I've done all the training. I know I'm ready for this. This is what it's all about. This is what we train for. So a little cluster of white with my parents, they were all there supporting me. They come all the way out to Beijing to watch me. I thought, wow, this is, this is it. And you guess what? When I say I was in the zone, you know what I mean? I was in the zone. Everything felt great. I was like, Usain Bolt going up to the start. I was ready. And I dived in, and the really annoying thing about being in the zone is that you don't actually remember what happened, because it felt so good. So when you get out of a race, you think, oh, what did I do there? What was so good about it? You can't remember, because it just happened. It just clicked. And that, that's what it did. And I touched the wall, and I turned around to look at the scoreboard to see what time I'd gone. Bearing in mind, I was in the outside lane. So when you're in the outside lane, it usually means you're not going to win, doesn't it? The, the middle lane is where all the magic happens. I was in the outside lane. Looked at the board. And all I could see was my face. And I was like, why is my face on the scoreboard? <laughs> what have I done? And I made some sort of like really silly pose. It came up as like funny face of the day in Beijing or something. Then the times came up. And it turned out I'd done a four second personal best. I'd won my heat and I'd qualified into the final in second. Whoa, I'd done it. It all, come to, it all happened at the right time. Training it would all come as I'd wanted it to. And I was ready for the final, or so I thought. So I got out of the pool, I did a bit of media. You know, everyone's like, oh, we're gonna, everyone's watching you back at home. You're like, wow, this is good. People are watching me. You're like, this is, this is pretty cool. And then when you come off the poolside, you then walk down a bit of a quiet alley, don't you? Back to, back to the training down pool and cooling down pool. And I was walking down that alley, I freaked out. Suddenly realized. This was the biggest sporting event in the world, and I was favourite to win a medal. And I might have been physically ready and physically trained for that event, but I had not mentally prepared for that kind of situation. I was not mentally prepared to have the pressure of being a medalist or winning a medal. And I was walking along, I was going, oh my God, maybe they weren't pushing themselves. Oh my God, mum and dad had come to watch me all this way. Imagine I don't win now. Oh my God, there's so much pressure. And all these little thoughts start popping into my head. So when I got to the cool down pool, I was just distracted. So when I was swimming down, I wasn't really doing my warm down properly. I didn't get my lactates done afterwards. I didn't check that all the rubbish was out of my legs. I was too nervous to drink my, cool, my recovery drink. Got back to the athlete's village. I was too nervous to eat. I couldn't even think about eating. When I tried to rest, my head was just spinning of all the different scenarios. And when I got back to the pool and I did my warm up, I felt terrible. I'm sure you guys can relate to that. You get in the pool and you think, oh my God, what's happened? I don't know what's happened. And what had happened is all those little things that I did so automatically when I felt quite relaxed and quite well rehearsed and knew what was going to happen next. I cut your local competitions. They'd all, gone out, they'd all gone out my head because I was worried about everything else that I couldn't control. So I was in the call-up room and I was looking at those people. Oh God, they, they've got an even better suit on now. Maybe they were taking it easy this morning. Oh my God, look, there's mum and dad, they're watching me. What if they think I, what if I let them down? All these silly little things that got the better of me. So when I walked out on poolside and I saw 14,000 people, I thought, they're not supporting me. They're looking at me thinking I've got a win. And it was a completely diff different atmosphere I was in. And when I dived in, I wasn't in the zone anymore. Felt everything. Felt like I di dived in the belly flop. Felt like I was swimming through syrup. 
And when I touched the wall and I looked back at the scoreboard, my face wasn't up there this time. Times came up, I wasn't first, I wasn't second, I wasn't third, I wasn't even fourth. I'd come fifth. I thought, missed out there, haven't I? That was it, gone. And when I looked at the time, which was even worse, the time was half a second slower than what I'd got in the, in the heat. And all I had to do was do that time again and I'd have a Paralympic silver medal around my neck right now. But half a second, which is that, was enough for me to miss out on a Paralympic medal. And that was all it took, just to miss a bit of food, to not rest, because all that training does all the hard work, does all that heavy duty stuff, but it's your head that ruins that final, final push. Because in a, in a final, in a 100 meter final, or a race where you're all lined up, you are all physically good enough to win that race. The ones that win it are the ones that mentally believe they can. And I didn't think I could, and that's why I didn't. And so I was like, how can I come away from this positive? Well, actually, if you'd said, Kate, if you c you're going to come fifth in Beijing before it all started, I would have gone, God, that'd be great, wouldn't it? That'd be awesome, making a final, competing at that level. I'll take that. So I, I tried to remember that and thought, what have I learned? Because this is what Beijing was all about. It was about a learning curve for me. And I learned that I needed to improve my, my mental toughness and my handling of pressure and nerves because I clearly had not nailed that one yet. So I went back and had to carry on at university. But then the competitions were starting to, to roll in. I was going to European Championships, World Championships. And like on that video you saw in Rio, I went there and I won medals there. And I started to really get on top of all those little things I needed to improve on. I was becoming the athlete that I'd always wanted to be, but a well-rounded athlete, not just a, a physically strong athlete. 2010, I graduated from university and decided, right, it's two years now, <coughs> two years till London, I'm going to go full-time. I don't really like that idea of going full-time athlete because, like I said, we don't earn 50 grand a week. You can't really rely on being a full-time athlete, but you would find very few athletes two years before London 2012 that weren't committing their life and soul to train for those Olympics and Paralympics. And I was one of them because I knew I, did wanna, I didn't want to co go to that event with any regrets, thinking I could have worked harder, could have done more. So that meant I went full time. I stayed at the University of Bath because I knew the setup there was great. They had nutrition, physio, psychology support, everything I needed all in one area. And I upped my training because I had time, I had the ability to do that. And I really finessed everything to make myself the athlete that I wanted to be. And a year of full time training, I went to compete for, so it was in Manchester actually, I still remember the event, it was trials for Europeans, the training had gone awesome, just as I'd hoped it would, it had been stepping up, it had been improving, and it was exactly a year before having to qualify for London, and every race went to plan perfect, could not have asked for a better result, I was breaking records, I was top rank in the world, and my sort of personal development was as I'd wanted it to be, I thought wow, one more year to go, I've got one more year of this and then it's going to all happen, it's going to all happen. And then about a month after that event, the training started getting really tough and really struggling and I wasn't doing the times that I'd wanted to do and I wasn't progressing anymore, I was almost degressing. I thought, oh, it's fine, everyone goes through bad spells of training, don't they? Everyone feels rough every so often. But the coughs and the colds turn to coughs and colds all the time. And then they turned into tonsillitis, and they turned into migraines, and they turned into, oh my God, I can't even get up in the morning. And it was a very frustrating time because I wasn't doing anything else other than swimming and training and working in the pool. So I had nothing else to distract me, and I couldn't work out what was wrong with me. But as an athlete, you become a little bit addicted and obsessed with being the best. And at that time, on the world rankings, I was the best. Therefore, I had to keep going because it was only a year till London, or it was only nine months till London, it was only six months till London, the countdown clock was in our training pool and I could see it every day. And the closer we got, the more obsessed I became with having to train, that I completely ignored the fact that I was losing weight, I was losing my hair, my face was blowing up into things, I couldn't, I couldn't work out what was wrong with me, but something wasn't right. And it got to a point where I was, was unable to train. I was being pulled out of the, the swimming pool because I was collapsing halfway through a session and kept ignoring people saying, oh no, I'm carrying on, carrying on, because actually no one could tell me what to do because it was my own decision. And it was about, 
think it was about five months before the trials for London, um, I got taken to the doctors because we couldn't let it go on. And I thought, I think I sort of knew what I had, but I didn't want it to be confirmed. But I had glandular fever and I'd burnt myself out completely burnt myself out mentally and physically and that's the one thing you can have this massive goal and nothing gets much bigger as for an athlete than your home Olympics or Paralympics but that goal almost paid, played against me because I wanted it so much that I pushed myself too far I didn't listen to my body I didn't listen to my health to a point that I went past no return and the doctor go Kate you can't keep training that you, you've, you, you've had it if you keep training, you're going to do more damage to yourself. But I was one of these really bad people that never listened to what people told them. Like, you remember when I chopped my arm off. Um, and I, I kept going. I had to half my training from doing about 30 hours a week to about 10. And I'd get in the pool and try and swim up and down a few lengths. And I thought, well, I've done 10 years of training. There must still be a chance. And I turned up to the trials in London at the Aquatic Centre. It was actually about two years ago, this time, actually. And, um, and I swam, and I missed out on qualifying for London by half a second. I will remember what half, half a second was. And actually, in swimming, half a second is quite a long time, because people have missed out by tenths, hundredths of a second. And that's when I realised what had happened, because when the doctor told me I wasn't going to make it, and when I started feeling bad, I didn't let that set in, because I knew I wanted to at least try. And if I try, then there's always a chance. And then suddenly that chance had gone. And I hadn't qualified for London. And I was not going to go to a home Paralympic Games. And the dream was over. And that was it, taken from underneath me. And for about two, three, four weeks, I was in a pretty bad place. I couldn't go near a swimming pool. I couldn't face people, because everyone was like, are you training for London? How's it going? How's it going? And every advert was, London 2012 is coming. And I, I knew that I was no longer going for it. I knew longer I was no longer, and that was my identity. I was Kate Gray training for London 2012. And that athlete identity had just completely hammered me into the ground that I didn't even know what I'd actually achieved because all I was wanting to achieve was London. What was I going to do? I actually got to a real low place and thought, what the hell have I been doing for 10 years? Why am I even here? What have I, what have I ever wanted to do? And then I started thinking, I can't do this forever. I can't feel sorry for myself. And if I felt like this in the hospital bed when I first lost my arm and found my right thumb and, you know, all those little moments of sort of strength that I'd gained and then going to school and proving people it's fine to have one hand and proving teachers wrong when they say you can't catch a ball and then proving people wrong that you can swim with one hand and you can train with other people. All those strengths that I'd sort of powered through, all those hurdles that I'd taken down were all coming back to me. I thought, OK, I'm not going to be swimming in London, but I still want to be involved in sport because I love sport and sport's made me who I am. What can I do? And it's just by chance that I was sort of speaking to a few people on, at the University of Bath and I was quite a confident young person, as, as I said, and I, I wanted to be a teacher, so I wanted to work in schools. I started working for the Youth Sport Trust, but to do that I had to go to an interview and stand there and tell my story. I had 10 minutes to explain it. Well, I haven't, done, I haven't done it in 10 minutes now, have I? So clearly it's got a little bit longer and I've rehearsed it a bit more. I had 10 minutes to explain. And I thought, well, I've got to tell them that I was training for London and I failed. That's pretty much my story. And when I stood there and I kind of went through like I've done with you today, and they finished and they, a few people had tears in their eyes because it was the first time I'd really admitted that I wasn't going to London, but I still think everything's going to be okay. And they're like, okay, we want you to go and deliver this in schools. I was like, oh my God, I've got to tell kids this. You know, kids just want to see medals. They want to see winners. They want to see champions. And they're like, no, but a lot of kids won't ever reach what they wanted to. They'll have to face these kind of hurdles and they'll have to overcome these challenges. And if they can remember your story and go, well, actually, Kate did that. So it's okay, I can still do it. Even if I don't become the fastest in my club or I don't you know, get an A in maths, it's fine because actually Kate still found a way around it and she's still happy and she's still positive. It's going to be okay. So that's why I kind of do my talks to realise that there are different ways of achieving what you want to achieve. And as a result, it was a great healing process for me. Not only did I hopefully inspire those young people that I was talking to, like I am today, but they inspire me because they make me feel okay <coughs> to have done what I've done. And the more and more I talk about it, the more and more I think, actually, I have done all right. 
I've achieved what I've achieved some good things in my life. I've represented my country. Look, I've got one of these hats with my name on. That can't be too bad, can it? And so that's what I try and remember, and that's what I try and stay positive about. And those things have actually turned into even more exciting things. So I said I still want to be involved in London 2012, and how could I? And I ended up getting a phone call. It's actually from the British Women Media Office, um, Media Officer, and I was like, oh, God, what does she want? Probably just wants some like interview about what it's like not to qualify for London, because we didn't hear many of them, did we? And um, she's like, Kate, I just wanted to ring you first because um, you're going to get a phone call from the BBC, and I was like, okay. They were like, they want you to work for them at London 2012, and I was like. Oh my God, started crying, fell off my chair. And she's like, this is why I rang you first, because you can't act like that on the phone to BBC. I was like, okay, so I pulled myself together. And when they rang me, they were like, okay, so what are you doing at the moment? And it was lucky that I was actually doing something. Otherwise, I'd have just said, I'm crying in my room because I'm not going to London. But I wasn't. I was out delivering to schools, telling them about the you know, London Paralympics and how great it is to be an athlete and how you guys can let sport change your life, all those sort of things. And they were like, great, we want you to work for us. And I was like, okay, that was pretty simple. It's not until at the end of the Paralympics they told me that I was up against an 11-time Paralympic gold medalist for that job. And they chose me because I had passion and I had understanding and I had the ability to present sport and show my love for a sport in the way that he couldn't because he'd always done it for the medals, whereas I'd always done it for the love of the sport. And you could tell that through the way I delivered my story or the way I delivered the, the commentary. So I thought, that's pretty cool, isn't it? That's when I realised the penny drops. It's not always about winning, guys. And I know they always used to say that at school, and I hated it when they said that at school, because I was like, it is about winning. We need to win all the time. But you don't have to win all the time. And as a result, I had an incredible time in London. I got to commentate on Ellie Simmons breaking the world record and beating the American girl in the 400 freestyle. I got to interview my best friend as she just won a silver medal. And actually I cried live on Five Live and got loads of people going, Kate, remember you're on the radio. <laughs> you know, people can hear you. And many times my dad's saying, you don't say it like that. You sound like a Bristolian, Kate. But I was like, well, I wasn't, wasn't, any, wasn't anyone other than myself. And hopefully people connected with that and had the best time of my life in a position where if I couldn't be there swimming, at least I could be there presenting to the rest of the nation how great Paralympic sport is. And you guys probably agree with me that, you know, there was a real change in perception the way people looked at Paralympic sport, but also disability, because they realised it, um, it was a pretty cool thing to be a part of. And as a result of that, and this is why I always kind of keep looking for that positivity and how can I keep striving for more, I was like, I loved that buzz of being in the media because it's like the start of a race when they go, take your marks, and you can feel yourself and you're shaking. That moment before you let everything happen, where well, you get that when they go, right, we're coming to you in 5K, you're going live, you're going live. It's just like that buzz you get when you're competing. And I was worried I was never going to find a sport or a, a job that could give me that buzz, and that's what the media does for me. So that's what I've been doing for the, for the past few years. Um, off the back of London, there was a real buzz around Paralympic sport and coverage and getting more and more people with those passions and interests into it. And I worked for, for Five Live. This is when I catch up on my um, pictures. So that's kind of my experience in London. And then since then, I've been, I worked with Sports Personality of the Year. I worked at Cheltenham Festival with racing. I worked at the London Marathon. And I've made sure that they haven't pigeonholed me into just covering disability in Paralympic sport. I want to do more than that. I want to cover sport in general because that is where my love for the sport is. I just love the idea of empowering people through sport and giving people a platform to tell their story. And then since September last year, so for the past few months, I've just been trained up to do TV sports reporting. And they've pretty much said to me, Kate, you bring us a story on someone you feel deserves to tell their story and we'll give you a camera and you can, you can run it. And for me, that's pretty much like achieving a goal but on a different point of view because it's actually reaching out to more people than just my own personal goal. So um, this Saturday, the Saturday just gone, I, I ran a story on Stephanie Slater who was uh, a young girl training for the London Olympics and uh, just in a normal training session she dived in and her arm just completely it had some weird condition and it completely malfunctioned and stopped working and she couldn't use it again and she thought she could never swim and she went to the London Paralympics as a games maker and saw people swimming with one arm like her and she decided that she's going to start swimming again and now she's she's training for the Commonwealth and for Europeans and she's just broken a European record and won medals at World Championships 
And for me, I got that girl on and I gave her a chance to tell her story, which may have been forgotten about five years ago or may have been forgotten about if, if I wasn't there. And this week I've got a trampolining piece. Who, who knows about trampolining? No one. That's why I want to cover it. And that's, that's kind of what my, my driving force is at the moment, and, and I love it. And, you know, what well, that never, never would have happened if I'd qualified for London. So sometimes these things happen for a reason. And like I said, all those goals that I achieved on that first, first list and becoming a teacher and becoming a Paralympic medalist, I haven't, I haven't done that. But actually, I'm doing something that's probably even more exciting. We always want to be a Blue Peter pre presenter when we're younger, don't we? Well... Hopefully, one day. <laughs> uh, but yeah, this is, and I have kind of dropped a few hints that I am still keeping myself fit and I am still training to a degree, but not full time training like I'm sure any of you guys are. Because I still feel a little bit of a, uh, an inkling around um, going for Rio. Uh, that's where I've kind of um, got my heart set on as an athlete. But one thing I do know is if that doesn't go to plan then hopefully I'll be there presenting or reporting and if that doesn't go to plan well I'll probably find another way to keep myself happy and probably get back to my dad's farm and start mucking out some animals but I'll find a way to enjoy it and hopefully that's something you guys can relate to.